from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to LJ119. We're so happy to see so many friends, uh, so many current Kluge fellows, and um, my predecessor, Carolyn Brown, who uh, joins us as a friend of, of mine and, and also of our, our speaker. And it was under her directorship that Peng Guoxiang uh, was, was recruited to the Kluge Center, and we're so happy to present his lecture tonight as the um, result of a lot of happy years of, of research here and in, in many other places. Um, tonight's introduction draws for me on deep childhood anxieties because I grew up as the child of two sinologists. Um, my mother is still teaching Chinese literature at Wellesley College. My father was a Chinese historian and my form of adolescent rebellion was to refuse to speak Chinese. Um, and unfortunately, I, I cannot refuse to speak Chinese in this introduction, although you, you may wish that I, I, I have. Um, I want to remind you that this program is being recorded. So when you ask your questions afterwards, if you could speak clearly. Um, and we're so happy to welcome uh, Peng Guoxiang for, for many reasons. Um, he's been a wonderful colleague here at the Kluge Center. He's a, a very deep scholar of Confucianism in its many incarnations. Um, he's currently a professor of Chinese philosophy, intellectual history, and religion <clears throat> at Zhejiang University, has taught also at Beijing University, and has held many visiting appointments at universities around the world, including in Singapore, in Germany, in Taiwan, and uh, several visiting fellowships at Harvard University at the, where he used the Yenching Library, which I, was basically the unpaid babysitting facility where my parents dropped off my brother and me just about every day of the 1970s. Um, if you read his recent interview with uh, Dan Torello in the Kluge Center blog, you'll see what a special scholar he is because um, he, he has gone so deep into the library's collections. He's made a special home in the Asian reading room here. And uh, we're, we're all happy that digitization has arrived and it facilitates our research in so many ways. But as he has proven, and as I think we all know intuitively, there's a lot more to the Library of Congress than what is uh, available on the surface, the, the digital surface. And, while here, he discovered that uh, we have 41,000 books that have not, that are early Chinese books that have not been digitized. And so he has made rich use of those collections and has added to his already um, amazing output as a scholar. Uh, the, the CV I have is a couple years old, but it lists um, no fewer than 70 articles that he has printed, pu published over the years. And he has uh, written seven books, and I'm sure there will be many more they include, let me just say a few of them, um, This Worldly Concern of the Wise, The Political and Social Thought of Mu Zongsan, The Unfolding of Innate Knowledge of the Goodness, Wang Ji and the Yang Ming Learning in Mid-Late Ming, Confucian Tradition Between Religion and Humanism, Confucian Tradition and Chinese Philosophy Retrospect and Prospect in a New Century, and Interpretation and Speculation of Confucian Philosophy. Um, so, he has taken a very old topic, Confucianism, and made it ever new. And uh, tonight he will do that once again with his lecture. And I'm, I'm especially proud to say that uh, we have a, a, a sinologist, a, a scholar of China, who is holding the Kluge chair in the countries and cultures of the North. We have never had that before, never a, a China specialist in that particular position. And, even though the word north implies a certain kind of Eurocentrism. Obviously, uh, China is, is north of the equator, and we're, we're very happy to expand our horizon in that sense. So please join me in welcoming Peng Guoxiang, who will speak on understanding Confucianism as a religious tradition, salient features, and significance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ted. Thank you for your introduction. 
uh, it's my uh, great pleasure and honor to be appointed as the uh, Kluge Chair uh, in Countries and Cultures of the North. And I, look, I would like to express my uh, gratitude to uh, Professor Yu Yingshi. Unfortunately, he cannot be here. And uh, Dr. Car Caroline Bra, uh, the former director of the uh, Kluge Center, uh, and uh, Dr. of course, Dr. Billington, and Dr. Shao Dongfang, uh, head of Asian division. Uh, unfortunately, he's not here, too. Uh, anyway, just one word. Uh, my thanks go to all the people who have been supporting me. <clears throat> As a professor of uh, Chinese philosophy, intellectual history, and uh, religion, and of uh, Confucianism in particular, I would like to introduce uh, Confucianism, one of the uh, great uh, traditions in the world to everyone here. Uh, Confucianism, Confucianism is uh, not something exclusively Chinese. It has been introduced to, developed, and uh, thrived in Japan, uh, Korea, and Vietnam, and other regions of East Asia. And now it is even accepted by uh, Western people uh, as an integral part of their spirituality and value system. An example is that two Christian theologians of uh, Boston University, and Robert Neville and uh, John Bersum, who were the dean and vice dean of uh, Divinity School, respectively, and publicly claim that they are Boston Confucians. It's very interesting. <laughs> but Chinese tradition is no doubt uh, the matrix of uh, Confucianism. So uh, what I'm going to say about Confucianism is based upon Chinese tradition. Before we uh, enter into that subject, I need to clarify that religiousness or spirituality is only one perspective from which to look at Confucianism as a tradition. Confucianism cannot be exclusively classified into any single modern discipline, philosophy, religion, or ethics, and so on. Uh, let me give you a, a story. In the 1930s, uh, one asked if Buddhism uh, can be called a religion or philosophy to Ouyang Jingwu, a modern Chinese Buddhist master, and he replied, Buddhism is neither a religion nor a philosophy. On the other hand, it is both a religion and a philosophy. And Ouyang Jingwu's answer seems paradoxical, but the meaning is actually simple. The classification system of modern Western scholarship is not adequate for defining Buddhism. Either religion or philosophy is just one dimension of Buddhism. The case of Confucianism is the same. Accordingly, when we look at if we, when we look at it from one perspective, it does not mean there are no other dimensions. Simply put, although, we, uh, although the talk here and now is about Confucianism as a religious or spiritual tradition, other dimensions, philosophical, ethical, historical, institutional, and so on, are also meaningful. Uh, I actually have more or less tackled these various aspects, too, in my work. And my talk includes three parts. Firstly, I will explore the question of whether or not Confucianism can be understood or can be uh, uh, defined as a religious tradition. And if so, in what sense this understanding is meaningful? Secondly, I will demonstrate there has been a strong dialogical dimension in the Confucian tradition all along. And this dialogicalness should be understood as one of the uh, distinctive uh, features of Confucianism. Finally, I would like to point out there are three contributions that Confucianism as a dialogical tradition can make to a uh, religious dialogue or dialogue among civilizations in a global context. These three contributions are number one, 
a principle of dialogue that advocates harmony without uniformity. Number two, a religious pluralism that refrains from both absolutism and relativism. And number three, a theoretical and uh, practical resource that entails multiple religious participation and multiple religious identities. <clears throat> Confucianism has been taught in departments of religious studies at universities in the US for many years. Yet, uh, for some people, it is still controversial to see Confucianism as a religion. And the controversy is even fierce and prolonged in Chinese-speaking world. I published a book called Confucianism Between Religion and Humanism by Peking University Press in 2007. And a, a revised version is going, to be, is going to come out this year too. And for me, I think I have already made this uh, issue clear. Unfortunately, there are still some, if not many, ambiguous understandings and uh, debates. So let me first of all, let me first of all uh, answer the question of whether Confucianism is a religious tradition. Whether or not Confucianism can be called a religion depends primarily upon what understanding of religion we have. No doubt, religion as a modern Western uh, term is uh, originally uh, from uh, the uh, Abrahamic tradition, as you know, including Christianity and Judaism and Islam. Accordingly, a transcendental personal God, an institutional church, and a single scripture become indispensable defining characteristics of being a religion. During the 20th century, however, some Western scholars uh, realized that religion encompassed much more than the traditional Abrahamic model. An increasing contact with the East suggested to them that religion need not be monotheistic, nor even deistic to serve as a civilization in the same fashion as the Abrahamic tradition served in the West. Examples are Buddhism and Hinduism in South Asia and Confucianism and Taoism in East Asia. So those Western scholars with global consciousness revised the traditional definition of religion and made it more comprehensive. Paul Tillich's uh, ultimate concern, John Hicks' human responses to the transcendent, and uh, uh, Frederick Strand's means of ultimate transformation, and so on, are all examples of this kind of revision. And the reason uh, that uh, Wilfred Kenwell Smith tried to replace religion by religiosity or religiousness is exactly to stress that religiosity is one, while various religions in the world are just different manifestations of this one. Therefore, if we realize that the core of a religion lies in its religiousness, religiosity, or spirituality, uh, which intends to make people have an ultimate and creative transformation, rather than in its particular form, such as those features that simply belong to Abrahamic tradition, our understanding of religion should be revised and enlarged. If we know that Buddhism is originally a atheism that strives for personal liberation, and Taoism has never accepted the separation between this world and the world of all kinds of spirits, and between body and heart-mind, and if we cannot deny that both Buddhism and Taoism are two kinds of religion in the world, we must embrace the idea that Confucianism should be considered as a religion. Why? Because it has provided a resource, both spiritual and practical, for human beings to become great persons, ren, noble persons, and sages, sheng ren in Chinese, by uh, 
by uh, unseasoned and uh, strenuous self-cultivation. Distinctively, a Confucian way of ultimate uh, transformation, the achievement of becoming a great person, a noble person, and a sage through self-cultivation does not mean a leap of faith from humanity to divinity in Kierkegaard's sense. Rather, it precisely means the full and perfect realization of our achievement of humanity itself. So Confucianism, together with some other spiritual traditions in the world, should be understood as a religious tradition, although it does not necessarily have the features of monotheism, nor is it necessarily institutional. In addition to the definition of uh, religion, there are still two criteria of judgment that make us, make us uh, consider Confucianism as a religious tradition. First, Confucianism has already been accepted by uh, other religious uh, traditions as an indispensable counterpart in the religious dialogue around the world. In, uh, inter uh, internationally, for many scholars, treating Confucianism as a spiritual and religious tradition has been an unquestioned starting point for further relevant discussions. A few books in the English-speaking world on Confucianism from the perspective of religious studies have been published since the 1970s. Quite a few international conferences on the dialogue uh, between Confucianism and Christianity have been held in Hong Kong, Boston, uh, and Berkeley. And all these are exactly reflections of this point. Secondly, we usually acknowledge that the insiders of a tradition have priority in defining their own traditions. A consensus shared by uh, representatives of uh, contemporary Confucian scholars is acknowledgement of the religious dimension of the Confucian tradition. For example, Tang Junyi, a noted Confucian philosopher of the 20th century China, uh, clearly articulated that Confucianism should be understood as a religious tradition. And he uh, has once even claimed that Confucianism should be reestablished as an institution, institutional religion. And Mao Zongsan, a contemporary of Tang Junyi, and another distinguished Confucian philosopher, delivered a lecture entitled Confucianism as a Religion in, 19, in 1959, many years ago, uh, which uh, was included as the chapter in his book, Characteristics of Chinese Philosophy. A well-known uh, manifesto of contemporary Confucianism drafted by these uh, scholars, Tang Junyi, and jointly uh, signed by Zhang Junmei or Carson Zhang, and Tang Junyi, uh, Mao Zongsan, and Xu Fuguan, uh, was published in 1958. It's, I think uh, uh, it particularly stressed the religious nature of Confucian tradition. So when we uh, carefully scrutinize the history of Confucianism, we should be uh, aware that the development of the Confucian tradition is actually a process of dialogue, including both dialogue with other traditions and a dialogue among different schools or ramifications within the Confucian tradition itself. It is this dialogical dimension or dialogicalness that enables Confucianism to be more and more enriched. Here, let me take uh, Confucianism in the in the Chinese and East Asian context as an example of this dialogical dimension. When it uh, emerged in the pre-Qing period, roughly the sixth century BCE, Confucianism was only one of various intellectual trends among the so-called Zhu Zibaijia in Chinese, literally many masters and hundreds of schools. But through dialogue with other masters and schools, Confucianism, which started locally, you know, in Shandong province, 
eventually became the dominant value system of Chinese civilization. Furthermore, even the thought of Confucius himself was shaped and developed from his dialogue with his students. If we look, if we look both at the analects, Lun Yu, which is uh, without doubt uh, the authoritative record of Confucius thought, and at some newly unearthed Confucian text inscribed on bamboo slips found in the 1990s, we can recognize that almost all Confucius said was in a dialogue with others, including his students, friends, uh, acquaintances, passers-by, uh, strangers, and even his rivals. From the Tang Dynasty to the Ming and Qing Dynasties, namely from the 7th century to the 18th century, the development of Confucianism was particularly characterized by a dialogue process. Inside China, after a long and productive dialogue with Buddhism and Taoism, uh, classical Confucianism was transformed into a new paradigm known as Neo-Confucianism, N-E-O slash Confucianism, which absorbed many Buddhist and Taoist ideas without giving up its own identity. Also, through embedded dialogue with local civilizations, uh, various new Confucian traditions with their own cultural characteristics were shaped in Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and other East Asian regions after Chinese Confucianism was introduced into these areas. <clears throat> in this period, it is no exaggeration to say that Confucianism in general played an important or even leading role in the whole of East Asian civilization. If East Asian civilization can be, a, can be a differentiated from Western civilization, West Asian civilization, and is Abrahamic religious, and from South Asian civilization and is Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, the defining religious tradition in East Asian civilization is nothing but Confucianism. Briefly, uh, throughout the process in which Confucianism was transformed into assuming a leading role of East Asian civilization from something simply Chinese, a striking feature of uh, Confucianism was still its dialogicalness. From the late Qing Dynasty till now, Confucianism has emerged into another period. In this period, one of the most uh, important features of new Confucianism is also its dialogical dimension. And compared with uh, the previous dialogue among uh, different branches inside the Confucian tradition and its dialogue with uh, Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity, and Islam. The dialogue of Confucianism with the whole of the Western spiritual world is, omni is omnidirectional and multi-level. In contrast to traditional Confucian scholars, modern Confucian, Confucians, I mean Confucians uh, from the 20th century till now, um, have to face and uh, understand the complexity and the diversity of various traditions in the world. In this sense, their burden is much heavier than ancient Confucians. For example, both Tang Junyi and Mao Zongsan engaged in a lifelong dialogue with Western philosophical tradition, especially German idealism. Their understanding of Western philosophy not only goes uh, far beyond the teacher, Xiong Shili, the uh, initiator of modern Confucianism, but also surpasses some Chinese scholars who are specialized in Western philosophy. As for Yu Ying Shi, I just mentioned, a great Confucian historian and the Kluge Prize winner in 2006, his understanding of Western culture in general and uh, Western history in particular surpasses that of his teacher, Chen Mu a great master of Chinese traditional learning in the 20th century China. Now, as we, as we know, religious dialogue can be further divided into two types, interreligious dialogue and intra-religious religious dialogue. The former refers to the dialogue among different religious traditions. 
for example, the dialogue between Confucianism and Christianity, the dialogue between Christianity and Buddhism, the dialogue between Hinduism and Islam, and so on. The latter refers to the dialogue among different branches or schools within one religious tradition. For instance, the dialogue among Baptist, Methodist, and Evangelicals in Christianity. But whatever perspective we uh, take, it is uh, pretty clear that the history of Confucianism is a dialogical process. First, let us look at the development of Confucianism from, uh, from the perspective of uh, intra-religious dialogue. I already mentioned the dialogical feature of Confucius' thought. After Confucius, Confucianism, even in preaching period, was already complicated. Different branches were always in a state of dialogue and sometimes conflict. Uh, typically, two different orientations initiated respectively by Mengzi and Xunzi were developed into an enduring dialogue by later Confucians. Although Confucianism in the Han Dynasty in general focused on commentary on the classics, and different approaches and their debates, especially Jinmen Jingxue and Gu Wen Jingxue, among others, were also reflections of the dialogue within Confucianism. As for Neo-Confucianism, a well-known debate occurred in 1175 between Zhu Xi, probably the most important Confucian scholar after Confucius, and Lu Xiangshan, another brilliant Confucian scholar and, and Zhu Xi's contemporary, reflected, reflected two different approaches to the Confucian learning in new Confucian tradition, and was not only polemic, but also dialogical. Furthermore, the leading, uh, the learning of the Wang Yangming school was particularly shaped not only through dialogue with the learning of Zhu Xi, but also through dialogue among many brilliant students and followers of Wang Yangming in basically in the uh, 16th and uh, 17th century. And most uh, works uh, recording the thought of almost all Neo Confucian masters recount their discussions and correspondence with their students, colleagues, friends, or even rivals. This is an outstanding feature that indicates the strong dialogical dimension of New Confucian tradition. Secondly, from a perspective of inter-religious dialogue, the dialogue between Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism reached its peak in the Lan Ming dynasty. And New Confucianism, per se, was the result of this interreligious dialogue, which uh, lasted hundreds of years. The so-called uh, East Asian consciousness was precisely shaped by the, uh, by the dialogue of Chinese Confucianism with local uh, cultures in Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and so on. This has already been mentioned previously. Now, I would like to add a couple of uh, examples to highlight the fruitful products resulting from the dialogue between Confucianism and Christianity and Islam in China. And those uh, great Confucian Christianities, uh, Christians, such as uh, Yang Qingyun, Xu Guangqi, and Li Zhizao, who all lived in the late Ming dynasty, namely uh, the 16th and 17th century or even the uh, Confucianized Jesuit missionary, uh, Matthew Risi, also of the late Ming dynasty, have already been studied. Recently, the thought of uh, Wang Daiyu and Liu Zhi, uh, which represent some of the uh, most important achievements of the dialogue between Confucianism and uh, Islam, also in the 16th and 17th century, have also received global scholarly attention. I, I do not need to uh, particularly uh, stress this uh, dialogical dimension of Confucianism. Some brilliant Chinese uh, Western minds have already realized this point. For instance, um, William DeBerry, a 97 years old distinguished professor of Columbia University, believes that the dialogical imperative has always been embodied in the Confucian tradition as an integral part of East Asian civilization. Actually, 
uh, when we look at um, Chinese history, we should realize that the Chinese, uh, the Chinese people have embraced almost every world religious tradition. Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, let alone Confucianism, and Taoism, and the various indigenous uh, popular religions. It is precisely because of this intrinsic dialogicalness of Confucianism and the, the uh, arrival of global, like, globalization that religious dialogue, as I have been trying to uh, argue, uh, must be a leading project of the 21st century Confucianism in a global context. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, salient features for the development of uh, contemporary Confucianism is moving in this exact direction. Now, uh, with, the, with the wave of uh, globalization, uh, religious uh, dialogue has become one of the uh, most striking issues in the world. Uh, if globalization means not only a process of uh, homogenization, but also a process of uh, heterogeneity, the reason for the latter uh, is the differences among various religious traditions. Therefore, how to treat those differences and try to alleviate the clash of civilization caused by religious uh, conflict through dialogue instead of confrontation has become an urgent issue for the, for the good life of every people in the world. Actually, an essential aspect of the clash of civilization, even in Samuel Huntington's sense, is still more religious, religious than political, economic, and so on. And Hans Kuhn's statement, there can be no peace among the nations without peace among the religions, and no uh, peace among the religious without dialogue among the religions, has been uh, uh, validated by history and become a consensus among people of vision. So in my view, uh, according to what it has done in history, a dialogical Confucianism can make at least three contributions, both uh, conceptually and practically, to a global religious dialogue. The first is a principle of dialogue called he er bu tong in Chinese, which uh, from Confucius means harmony without uniformity. Until now, most participants of religious dialogue in the world always have al already have uh, realized that the purpose of dialogue should not and cannot be to transform others' beliefs into their own. Otherwise, the result is, uh, is monologue rather than dialogue and fruitless and um, unavoidably leading to conflict. A dialogue should be a process of uh, mutual learning. The minimum purpose of dialogue sh should be to deepen mutual understanding. Although mutual understanding does not necessarily mean mutual appreciation, it is a precondition for minimizing the possibility of the large-scale clash of uh, uh, civilization caused by religious conflict. In the Confucian tradition, the principle, harmony without uniformity, advocated by almost every Confucian throughout history, has always been uh, respected as a way of coexistence. This principle means every individual shares a sense of togetherness and integration, while his or her individuality is fully developed. Obviously, this should be a basic principle for global religious dialogue uh, at present and in the future. Maybe uh, the base state uh, that we can, we can hope to achieve. There are two uh, extremes about religious uh, dialogue. One is a particularism that believes dialogue is fruitless and there cannot be a helpful communication between different religions. The other is a universalism that believes dialogue is a panacea that can lead people with different religious backgrounds to a, uh, to a homogeneous state. By contrast, the Confucian principle of uh, harmony without uniformity, which goes beyond 
excessive pessimism and optimism can provide a reasonable and feasible middle ground for global religious dialogue. The second contribution is Confucian pluralism. Confucian pluralism. pluralism. Now, we know that the attitude a religion take, takes toward other religious tradition can be um, typologically divided into three categories, exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. A exclusivist denies the value of other religious traditions and claims the, mo uh, the monopoly of religious truth. A inclusivist concedes that other religions can have truth, but he or she will say the truth other religions have is already included in his or her own religion, and this truth is not ultimate. Only his or her religion can reveal the ultimate truth. Karana's anonymous, anonymous Christians is an example of this standpoint. The third one is uh, religious pluralism. It is now a very influential trend, which not only accepts that other religions can reveal truth, but also realizes the particularity or limitation of every religious tradition. And contrary to inclusivism, this standpoint does not uh, presuppose the priority of a certain religion. A religious pluralist believes that every religion can provide a way of ultimate transformation. As John Hicks' metaphor suggested, all religions in the world should be considered as a rainbow of human faiths. They are different reflections of the same light of divinity. Of course, every, religious, of every religion cannot be simply and absolutely clarified into any one of these three types, while every religion can simultaneously include these three attitudes toward other religions. Because of its open-minded standpoint, religious pluralism has been increasingly accepted by more and more liberal minds. But pluralism in general has to face the danger of becoming a kind of uh, relativism. Pluralism uh, with an uh, implication of uh, relativism apparently can accept every religion, but actually denies there can be a unified truth of the ultimate in the cosmos. It is not willing to or cannot seriously consider that different religions can treat the unified truth of the, of the ultimate in different ways and uh, stress different aspects of the same truth. It consequently undermines the necessity of dialogue among religions. So significant, the, the significance of a Confucian pluralism is that Confucianism throughout its history has developed a middle ground. As a dialogical tradition, Confucian religious pluralism advocates that on the one hand, every, religi every religious tradition is a manifestation of the way or a unified truth of the ultimate while the absolute truth that every religion claims is only a convenient way, yupaya in Buddhism, or relative absolute. Not the absolute per se as the ultimate truth. On the other hand, the ultimate and the unified truth of the ultimate should be acknowledged, no matter whether or not this ultimate reality and truth can be clearly uttered with one accord. I've, I've named this uh, distinctive uh, feature of Confucian pluralism as li yi fen shu, in Chinese, a term from uh, New Confucianism, which literally and roughly means one principle, many manifestations. The third contribution uh, Confucianism can make is a conceptual and practical a resource of uh, multiple religious participation and multiple religious identity. And multiple religious participation means a believer in a religion fully gets involved in another religion or other religions. 
and eventually becomes an inner participant rather than an outer observer. Accordingly, once one becomes not only an inner participant, but also a believer in another religion or other religions, while not giving up his or her original religious faith, this person already has multiple religious identities. You know, both multiple religious participation and multiple religious identities were issues raised by contemporary Western uh, theologians or scholars in religious studies uh, against a background of global uh, dialogue, global re religious dialogue. For a conventional believer in Abrahamic tradition, multiple religious participation is very difficult, if not totally impossible. And multiple religious identities are basically, I think, beyond his or her ability to imagine. But religious dialogue in academia or real religious dialogue uh, motivated by uh, globalization, especially as part of the uh, wave of uh, immigration, compel this issue to become a focal awareness of Western religious people. Intriguingly, in China or East Asia, uh, there has been a long history of multiple religious participation and multiple religious identities. In the dialogical history of Confucianism, a rich experience about multiple religious participation and multiple religious uh, identities has already been accumulated. In other words, for the Confucian tradition, multiple religious participation and multiple religious identities have already been a precondition or starting point for further consider consideration of relevant questions instead of a problem uh, still needing to be wrestled with. For example, uh, there were many brilliant Confucians who went back and forth uh, with ease among Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism in the late Ming Dynasty. Uh, they, on the one hand, deeply engaged in the spiritual world of both Buddhism and Taoism, including uh, frequently communicating uh, with Buddhists and Taoists, establishing deep and lasting friendships with, with them, making commentaries on and publishing Buddhist and Taoist uh, uh, classics, and even uh, practicing Buddhist meditation and uh, Taoist inner alchemy. On the other, they still had their strong Confucian commitment and identity, or they still defined themselves as Confucian rather than Buddhist uh, or Taoist. And even now, mm, many temples established in different dynasties in Chinese history still offer uh, sacrifices to Confucius, Laozi, as you might know, the founder of Taoism, and Buddha in one horse at the same time. And all these are exactly uh, ref reflections of multiple religious participation and multiple religious identities. As Paul Martinson observed, the life of the uh, Chinese people has always been with diversity of religious experience in history and a positive attitude toward this diversity has accordingly been developed. In this sense, we can say that the issue of multiple religious participation and multiple religious uh, identity has already acquired its answer, both conceptual and practical, in a dialogical uh, Confucian tradition with a plural vision. So I do believe that uh, more resources is from Confucianism. If properly transformed, can contribute to the global religious uh, dialogue in the age of uh, dialogue or death. The story of uh, so-called Boston Confucianism, which I mentioned at the very beginning, is very inspiring. Both Robert Neville and John Bertrand, who are sincere Christian Methodist uh, ministers and professors of uh, Christianity, have uh, claimed that they are also Confucians, since they also espouse the core values of Confucianism. Robert Neville even published a book exactly called 
Boston Confucianism, a portable tradition in the late modern world. No doubt, the emergence of uh, Boston Confucianism is the, uh, is the uh, newest example of, uh, I think it's the new, newest example demonstrating uh, that multiple religious participation and multiple religious identities have already been happening between Confucianism and uh, Christianity in the US. This case also indicates that the leading project of uh, contemporary Confucianism in a global context is primarily the uh, development of uh, religious and uh, spiritual dialogue. Last but not least, I would like to, to say, and I do believe that the dialogicalness and the uh, contributive resources discussed just now are not exclusive to the Confucian tradition. We can definitely find similar virtues, more or less, in other religious or spiritual traditions in the world as well. If this part of every tradition in the world can be jointly advocated and promoted, a good life for all human beings based upon solidarity, harmony, and common goods would be eventually realized. And it's not, it's not a unreachable ideal anymore. So let me stop here. Thank you all. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.